people have lived to see today. And so we want to just thank him. Thank the Lord in your heart. Thank him for his divine protection. Thank him for whatever reason you have. Week upon week, he enables us to come together to listen to him. He speaks to us, he guides us, he helps us. It's a joy, more especially in the season we find ourselves in. We are remembering his sacrifice on the cross for us. And tonight our topic fits so much into the, the, the season. Thank him for your family. Thank him for the lives of each and every sister on our page. Despite all our troubles and our shortcomings, he enables us to do what we do, to bring glory to his name. Thank him. Rabo Satay and Abakari and Ere Mashande. Libo Sika Barunda Ramashi Vidi Vikabo Randere Masatayanda. Lima Kota Basura Bashande. Rando Satayandi. He said, Where two or three are guarded in his name, he's there with us. Why don't you thank him for his presence with us? Whatever reason you join, why don't you commit it into your hands? Like the woman with the issue of blood, telling him, Lord, if you don't touch me, I am not leaving this session. Like I always say when I, I host, we are not coming to listen to human beings. We are coming to hear the Holy Spirit talk to us. Commit yourself into his hands. That for whatever reason you joined, Trust him that you will never go the same. You will never leave this page the same. We haven't come to listen to human beings. We've come to listen to what he has for us to do. Labor satay and in the name of Jesus. Sakaburanda bashande rebakayande masu tayanda rakota bazande. In the name of Jesus, almighty and everlasting Father, we thank you for another time in your presence. Father, we thank you for all the opportunities you keep giving us day after day, month after month, years after years, as a group and as individuals. We don't take it for granted. And so we thank you for bringing us together again to hear from you. Have your way, have your way in our lives, have your way in our environments, have your way in the session. Glorify your name alone. Teach us, Lord, teach us. Let us learn something out of this session that we will walk in your ways and inherit what you have promised us. To you be all praise in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Okay, so before I talk about the introduction of the topic, let's invite our sister Nelly. Let me see whether she's with us to lead us to our father's throne room. Okay, sister Nelly is with us. Sister Nelly, could you kindly lead, lead us in a short time of worship and praise? Okay. Thank you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Can you hear me? Pray with this. Thank you, Father, for a time in your presence. We just want to give you glory and we just want to adore you, Lord. Thank you. Jesus, name above all names, beautiful Savior. Glorious Lord, oh, Emmanuel, 
God is with us, precious Redeemer, live and work. Jesus, you are the name of a whole Beautiful Savior, glorious Lord, oh, Emmanuel, God is with us, precious Redeemer. You're the living word. Emmanuel. Emmanuel. His name is called Emmanuel. He's glorious, revealing us. His name is called Emmanuel. Jesus, name of all names, beautiful Savior, glorious Lord, oh, in my God is with us, precious Redeemer, living world. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus. Name of a born beautiful Savior. God is with Precious Redeemer, you're the living word. Emmanuel, Emmanuel, his name is called. Emmanuel is God with us, revealed in us, his name is called Emmanuel. Just give him the worship that is due him. Emmanuel. He's Emmanuel. Emmanuel. His name is called. Thank you, 
Jesus. In my new world, he's called with us. Rebuilding us. His name is called. Emmanuel. Thank you, Jesus. You are Emmanuel, Lord, and we give you glory. We thank you for the precious blood. Your precious blood that you shed for us, Lord. We give you all the glory. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Emmanuel, we give you the glory, we give you all the adoration, Lord, because you share your glory with no man. Thank you, Jesus. 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 Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. God richly bless you, Sister Nelly. We thank the Lord for what he's doing in our midst. Hallelujah. Sisters, welcome again to tonight's How To Series. The session where we learn and we share what the Lord is doing in us and through us to encourage all of us, each and every one of us. So we will continue in the good work that the Lord is doing in our midst. Tonight we are looking at the topic, being a manifestation of God. And I want to take just a minute to clarify it because it seems like the understanding is not um coming up as we intended it to. So it's all about manifesting Christ or manifesting God in our various homes, in our workplaces, and in fact, in every um, sphere of life. Once we, are, we have become children of God, we are to manifest Christ wherever we find ourselves. Sometimes we are quick to say, oh, manifest Christ to the world. It doesn't end there. It doesn't start there. In fact, it starts with our homes because the people we live with, they are the people we mingle with more. They are the people, I mean, in fact, they are the first point of contact, you know, as soon as we wake up from bed. So if we have to manifest Christ, be like God, it will start from our homes. within our families. That is where we can show that kind of behavior. What does it mean to manifest God? What does it mean to manifest Christ? How does it sound to you? Tonight the Holy Spirit is in our midst to teach us. So when we look at the topic, man being a manifestation of God, someone would think that's okay. Are they saying that I should be God? No, we are not saying we should be God because we cannot be God. There's a psalm that says that ye are God and children of the Most High, but it's a different thing altogether. We can imitate some of his um, attributes, but we cannot um, be God in ourselves as he is the creator and omnipotent. We can imitate his om- uh, omnipotency. So what we are saying is found in Ephesians 5, verse 1. Imitate God, therefore, in everything you do, because you are his dear children. Live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. He loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. Imitate God in everything you do, because you are his dear children. We need to imitate 
and the one we are imitating, our templates, living in us. But we are not the ones to say that I am like Christ. Okay, I am imitated. It's the people who see us. They will see our true reflection as to whether we are looking like God or we are looking like, like something else. Tonight, as the word of God comes, it's always an encouragement, not a condemnation, not a criticism. I always encourage us. Let's allow the spirit of God to search our hearts. The Bible says the spirit of God is the candle of the Lord. He searches the innermost belly. Let's allow him. Let's allow him to tell us, show us who we truly are. His word is like fire. It says it breaks even rocks into pieces. Pray that the hardest area of our lives where we are struggling that we don't even want to accept. Pray that the Spirit of God will allow him to enter that sphere of our life so we can look more like Jesus where we don't. And I say with caution, we are in a process of being made like Jesus. So let's allow this session to benefit us. We are in the season of Easter. We are talking about remembering and thanking the Lord for his great sacrifice on the cross for us. And I was talking to somebody and I was telling him, it is not much of what we are remembering, but how much of that experience, how much of that work the person did has impacted your life. How much? It's not about the morning, the programs we would put in place, the reflection. Yes, we are reflecting. How much more year by year do we reflect him? How much of him is seen in us, in our marriages, in our homes, wherever we find ourselves? And sisters, we all know Sometimes when we are cool in our corner, they will think we are okay. But when we are put under pressure, that is when what is in us comes out. But Father is still working on each and every one of us. Let us not lose heart by what we will be hearing tonight. Let's allow the Spirit of God to teach all of us. He is the potter, we are the clay. He is making us to be like him. All we have to do is to respond and work with him. So tonight, we are not coming to listen to testimonies. We are coming to hear from the Holy Spirit what it means to manifest Christ. What does it mean? How do I do it? And if I'm unable to, where I am feeling, how do I handle that? We have our sisters with us whom the Lord will be using to bless us. So without wasting time, let me call... Sister Moore to share with us what the Spirit lays on her heart. Sister Moore, kindly unmute and take over. God bless you. Thank you so much. And good evening, sisters. Thank you that you've made it to this place. I'll call it a place, a meeting place, so that we will hear the word of the Lord. And I want to say a word. A short word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I commit myself into your hands. I pray that you will take absolute control, take over me, speak through me, and let your word touch lives and transform each and every one of us into the very image of Christ. In Jesus' mighty name, I pray. Amen. So, as the moderator said, we are looking at the topic being a manifestation of God. And so what does it mean to be a manifestation of God? Simply put, it means to model Christ, to be or behave like Christ, to demonstrate the nature of God or Christ. That wherever you go, people will look at you and say, oh, I have seen Christ. Just because of your character, your nature. 
I want us to look at Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23, and I read, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. These are the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And when we look at Jesus, he demonstrated all these traits. All of them, not one did he miss. And why, why was he able to demonstrate all? It was because he himself was conceived of the Holy Spirit. He came from the Holy Spirit. And so if a dog will give birth to a dog, a lion will give birth to a lion, then it is only fair that the Holy Spirit will give birth to the Holy Spirit. He will just you know, demonstrate his, his nature. And because Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit, that was why he was able to, you know, demonstrate all these traits of the Holy Spirit, the fruit of the Holy Spirit. He was so peaceful in a very troubled world. He had a lot of love and joy. He demonstrated what we call the unconditional love. When it comes to long suffering, he demonstrated that in all situations, kindness, he was kind to the underprivileged, to everybody, but especially even to the underprivileged. He was so good to even sinners. He was faithful to the unfaithful. The Bible says that, I mean, in, in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He did not look at our circumstances. Otherwise, he wouldn't have died for us. But he was so faithful to his calling that he died for us while we were yet sinners. And he was gentle and demonstrated self-control in all his trials. He faced a lot of difficult situations, but he was gentle and self-control. And as I've said, it's because he had the nature of the Holy Spirit in him. So when we look at Luke chapter 1, verse 35, it is there that, that Mary was told that he will give birth to this great one. He will be conceived by the Holy Spirit. In Luke chapter 3, verse 22, when he was being baptized, the Holy Spirit came down, sat on his head like a dove, and the voice of the Father said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. In Luke chapter 4, verse 1, the Holy Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. You see, he just allowed, uh, let me say it this way, he yielded to the Holy Spirit. And that was why he was the way he was. So full of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was very instrumental in the ministry of Jesus Christ. He worked, he worked the miracles through him. He gave him the word of knowledge, the wisdom, the discernment, etc. And Jesus was attentive to the Holy Spirit. He didn't do anything by his mind. He just flowed with the Holy Spirit. Throughout his life on earth, he was never alone. He had a companion, which is the Holy Spirit. At every stage of his life. So the Holy Spirit helped him, you know, in every step of the way, he also strengthened him, he encouraged him, he comforted him, you know, mention it. And that was because Jesus, whilst he was on earth, 
he was 100% human. And so, because of that nature, he had to depend solely on the Holy Spirit. He didn't say that he was God, and so he would not listen to the Holy Spirit. He didn't do that. But because he was 100% man, he depended, depended on the Holy Spirit. When he died, it was the Holy Spirit that raised him from the dead. The Bible says in Romans chapter 8, verse 11, that if the spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, it will quicken your mortal body. So it was even the Holy Spirit that raised him from the dead. And that is why every human being must not live without the Holy Spirit. All these things point to the fact that we can manifest God, we can manifest Christ, we can be like Jesus if we allow the active role of the Holy Spirit in our lives. If we don't, then we cannot be like him. Because if Jesus was the way he was because of the Holy Spirit, then it, it, it's incumbent on us to pray for the Holy Spirit to be our guide. He is our guide. And that is why when we give our lives to Jesus, we also receive the Holy Spirit. But it's our responsibility to pray for the infilling of the Holy Spirit. We have to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And that is when you'll be able to live like Christ. We need the Holy Spirit to be like Christ. And this must be a daily walk, a daily affair. Every now and then, we must be asking the Lord for the infilling of the Holy Spirit so that we can be like Christ. We must daily ask the Holy Spirit for help. There is no way that a believer must get up and do whatever he or she likes. We must ask for help. We must allow the Holy Spirit to guide us. We must yield to the Holy Spirit. And that is when we can be like Jesus. Now, if we really want to manifest God, then we must be imitators of Christ. We must learn Christ. Now, in a given situation, we must ask ourselves, what would Jesus do in this situation? And align with that. If you are in a particular situation and the thing is overwhelming, whatever it is, you must ask, what would Jesus do in this situation? And when you get the answer, just align. When we face difficult or challenging situations, how many of us ask for God's will to be done? How many of us ask or pray the will of God for our lives? But Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane prayed three times that the Father should take away the cup. Fortunately for us, he added that the will of God be done. And the will of God was to save mankind. And therefore, Jesus had to go to the cross. He had to be crucified. He was like a sheep being led to the slaughter. And so I want to read Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 53. Just a moment. Verse 7. It says, he was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before his shares is silent. So he opened not his mouth. This is Jesus. The whole king of kings and lord of lords being led to the slaughter, and he did not utter a word. 
Can we do that? We cannot if we don't yield to the Holy Spirit. But he did that. And so God is asking us, just as this Jesus did, he's asking us in, in 1 Peter 3, verses 1 and 2, and I read that quickly. It says, First Peter, sorry, First Peter 3, verses 1 and 2. It says, Wives, likewise, be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the way, they without the way, sorry, they without a way may be won by the conduct of their wives when they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear. So this is the word of God to us. Jesus was very quiet. He did not open his mouth. And God is asking us that when we are in our homes, when we have an issue with our husbands, when this husband does not obey the word, you see the, the definite article, the, the word, that means that God is referring to the scriptures. They, without a word, this one, the air here is an indefinite article. And so God is saying that you have to be quiet. You must not open your mouth. Without a word from you, you keep your quiet. This man may be won by the conduct of his wife. And it's very, very important. If we are learning Christ, then whatever Christ did, we should do likewise. Because that was what brought him victory. He's expecting us to behave like Christ in our homes. He's not expecting you to argue with your husband, nag, complain, show him where power lies, or show him that you are an emancipated woman. That is not what God has called us to be as believers and as wives. He wants you to be quiet, but to act like Christ. So, how many of us demonstrate Christ in our marriages, in our offices, at the marketplace, in our neighborhood? How many of us? But when we imitate Christ, when we want to demonstrate or manifest God, we need to study the way Christ lived. We need to study the way he talked. We need to study the way he behaved. The way he behaved in the face of, you know, uh, uh, challenging circumstances. And by the help of the Holy Spirit, we can do same. Hallelujah. Now, sometimes when we fail to manifest Christ, we force the hand of God against us. He takes us through some, you know, difficult, difficult situations to enable us conform to the very image of Christ. Otherwise, how does that benefit the kingdom? Now, when you don't demonstrate Christ, when you don't manifest Christ, when you are not like Jesus, how will that benefit the kingdom of God? It won't. It won't benefit the kingdom. It will rather tarnish the image of Christ. And that is why God wants us to be like Jesus. So whatever it takes for us to be like Jesus, he will cause it to come into our lives. We are supposed to be like Christ so that unbelievers will be attracted to Christ by our lives. The Bible says um, in Matthew, let me go there quickly, Matthew chapter 5. 
Matthew chapter 5. I'm reading from verses 13 to 16. 13 to 16. It says, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing, but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. We are supposed to be like Jesus so that men, the people we live with, will glorify the Father because they will see the hand of the Lord in our lives, in every aspect of our lives they will see the hand of God. I cannot say that I'm a believer, but I'll do things that will bring shame to the kingdom of God. Did Jesus do that? No. And if I say that I'm manifesting Christ, then I shouldn't come to that place to do things like that. And if I, I can do that, it means that I must yield to the Holy Spirit. Because as I always say, it is not by might, nor is it by power, but it's by the Holy Spirit. If we do not yield our members to the Holy Spirit, we cannot be on this journey. Because this journey is not a physical one. It is so spiritual. It is supernatural. And you need the supernatural to empower you to be able to be on this journey. Hallelujah. And so Paul said something in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 31, that I die daily. We have to die daily. The flesh has to die. In Galatians 5, 24, he said, we crucify the flesh. Believers have to crucify the flesh. That is our responsibility. But we, 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 we do it with the help of the Holy Spirit. We must die daily, die to the flesh, die. The flesh has to die. And because Jesus killed the flesh, the flesh could not manifest in his life. And that was why he took so many successes whilst he was on earth. So sisters, this is the word of God to us. My last quotation I'm taking from 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. And I read, But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. So, to conform to Christ, we must study the Scriptures. We must actually spend time in the Word so that we can behold the image of Christ. The word of God says in, in John chapter 1, verse 1, that in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. So the word of God is Jesus. Says the word was made flesh and dwelt among men. As we keep on studying the word, as we spend time in the word, we behold the image of Christ. And the Holy Spirit opens our eyes to see Jesus. He is the one who does that. So whilst you are sitting down studying the way, 
the Holy Spirit is opening your eyes to see Jesus in the way. And he's the one who helps us to become like him. And that is when we will be able to relate to our husband's world, to relate to the people around us in a very cordial manner, to relate to even the underprivileged, our households and, and all manner of people, those that we even find difficult to love. It is the Holy Spirit who works in us to live above reproach. And so some, some of us ask the question, why is it that we, 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 we always talk to the women? Why? It's because we are on this platform. It's, it's a women's affair on this platform. So we speak to you. And so just as God spoke to the woman, the wife, that they should be silent in the home. Let your husband observe your chaste conduct. So it is in your submission that you'll be able to draw your husband to Christ. It is not when you argue with him, when you nag, when you complain. There is a strategy. And that is what God teaches us here. And that is why we speak to the women in that manner. And I want each and every one of us to, I mean, realize that when we do well, we are the ones who will get the rewards. In fact, if you are working in an office and one of your colleagues is, is, is lazy, doesn't work hard, you never say that, oh, because um, Ajah doesn't work hard, I will also not work hard. You, don't, you never say that. You actually work hard because you know that at the end of the month, you'll be paid. And possibly you, you may even get a promotion. Your salary can be raised. And so you don't look at your, your colleague who is not working hard in much the same way. When we go and stand before our maker, the one who has done well is the one who will be rewarded. So look, if your husband is not even doing well, continue to obey the word, continue to align with the word, continue to manifest Christ, continue to imitate Christ, continue to yield to the Holy Spirit. Because over there is an individual affair. God will never say that, oh, I understand because your husband behaved this way, so I understand. No. God is expecting you, he is expecting me to play the role that he has assigned me to. He's not looking at my husband, he's looking at me. He has told me to submit. He has told me to be quiet in the home. He has told me not to complain and argue with my husband. I must submit and therefore I submit because I am submitting unto the law. It was not my husband who asked me to submit to him, no. So I am submitting unto the law. And at the end of the day, when you stand before your maker, you are the one who will get the reward. And so just as you don't, you know, uh, um, um, imitate your friend who is not working, but you keep on, you focus on your work and you do it diligently. God is also expecting me. He's expecting you to focus on the assignment that he has given me and you, your role as a wife, your role as a mother, your role as a believer, your role as a believer in a community, your role as a believer living in the world. We are in this world, but we are not of this world. And God is expecting, no matter the challenges that you go through, no matter the, the, the trials, he is expecting you to stand as a believer, to stand like Christ. And so let us endeavor to be like Christ, to do what God expects us to do. And that is when our lives will shine and it will affect the people around us and they will also come 
to the saving knowledge of Christ. But when our lives do not shine, we rather push them away. Let us live in such a way that our lives will draw men unto Christ in the mighty name of Jesus. So we yield to the Holy Spirit. Now, if you are finding it difficult to, to, to be like Christ, then you have to pray. Because God wants us to pray. He says that we should pray at all times. And in our everything, we must offer prayer. Whatever the difficulty is, you must call on God. He is faithful and he will answer. So I pray that all of us will actually yield to the Holy Spirit, call on the name of the Lord when we come face to face with difficulties, and then God will, be, will manifest through our lives in the mighty name of Jesus. So I bring my submission to a close. Thank you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. Sister Pell, I hand over to you. Amen. Yes. Amen. God richly bless you, Sister Maud, for sharing with us deep truth from the word of God. Sisters, you heard it for yourself. And from, from the Holy Spirit, sorry. You've heard all that she said. So I'll try to summarize. So what the Spirit of God spoke through our sister and which stuck with me is that even Jesus Christ, our Lord, our template, the one we are aspiring to become. Even him, he depended on the Holy Spirit. And he was submissive even unto death. When we look at the life of Christ, like we've heard, we may think, oh, it's a, it's a, it was an easy journey for him. We may think that because he was part God and part human, it was easy for him. And we may even forget that he dealt with human limitations like we are dealing with. And so he's a perfect example. Did he have people insulting him? Yes. Did he have people challenging him? Yes. Did he have people not believing in him? Yes. If he hadn't gone through all that we are going through now, he couldn't have been a perfect savior. And so if Jesus himself uh, surrendered to the Spirit's help, then you and I, need him even more so we are being encouraged by the holy spirit through our sister to depend on the holy spirit the word of god reading the word studying the word after that what do we do with the information we are to imitate him imitate christ in everything we do win our loved ones not by words not with our plenty talking plenty explanation and sometimes it's just, it's amazing you know outside the setting of home we are able to exercise self-control when we go to work and our bosses speak to us anyhow we don't talk back we are not slapping them we are not fighting them we are not challenging them it is in the context of our homes why do we struggle to show that same attitude we show in the office in our homes. We struggle, but it is well. We have the Holy Spirit. We have the Holy Spirit. One thing she said also that touched me so much is that if our lives do not bear fruit, if we don't show the fruit of the Spirit, we are not being, we, we don't look like Christ. We are not. Father will intervene. Because why would he do that? From the scripture she read, one of the scriptures she read, we are being transformed. It's work in progress. First Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 3, 18. She read it to us. We are being transformed into the same image of Christ from glory to glory by the Holy Spirit. So if we fight the work of the Holy Spirit, Father will come with the discipline to make sure because at the end of the day, 
the blood of his son cannot go waste. So like we always hear, do we want to yield to him or we want him to bring his shears to come and prune, you know, allow difficult situations just to help us align to a certain behavior. Yesterday I was listening to um, Billy Graham, the late Billy Graham, and he said it. He said that giving your life to Jesus Christ may sound easy and appear easy, but walking with Jesus Christ is not an easy journey because you will have to die. Nothing more about you. Everything should be about Christ. My sisters, let's be encouraged. We are on a journey. The Spirit of God will help us. He's helping us. Let us not fight his hand that is molding us. Let us not fight his hand. So the word of God is coming to encourage us. Looking like him means behaving like him. One day, the Holy Spirit, there was an issue, and he, he reminded me of um, <laughs> First Peter First Peter 2. Verse 22, he said that when Jesus was um, insulted, he never retaliated. When he suffered, he never threatened revenge. He left his case in the hands of God, who always judges fairly. He used the scripture to prompt me, and he's still working in me. You know, as though God arranges the situation where I'll be accused left and right, sometimes I'm being bombarded. But then I realized that once he has spoken the word, it will be a journey I'll be on. So I get to master when someone puts their hand in my eyes and I'll be able to sit still and commit to him and not <laughs> behave in a way that will not show Christ. That is not to say we should be, excuse me to say, um, foolish. Because Jesus was not foolish. He's teaching us self-control. Self-control. We thank the Lord for his message to you. And I, I know he will help us. He will help us because we are working in progress. And Jesus also said in John 15, 8, that by this my father is glorified, that you bear much fruit. So when we read scriptures like this, let's allow it to comfort us that our father himself wants us to look like Jesus and bear fruit. So he will continue to help us. He will continue to work in us. Hallelujah. We have another sister who would love to share with us. Sister Joyce. Let me call her. Okay, Sister Joyce, kindly Hello. unmute and Yes, kindly unmute and share with us what the Lord has laid on your heart. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Sister Pro. Thank you all sisters on the, the platform right now. Uh, God is good. God is so good. I really thank God for such an opportunity um, to come and just fellowship with you all, just to share and learn from his word, learn his truth. It's, an, it's just an amazing grace, amazing grace. Heavenly Father, I commit my time of sharing into your hands. Holy Spirit, thank you for your presence here. Have your way. Continue to have your way. Thank you, Lord. Amen. So greetings, my sisters. I hope that you're all having a good evening. And it's already, it's almost midnight. So I would say happy Easter to you all <laughs> from where I am seated. Um, when I'm when I think about the manifestation of God in my life, and uh, we have rightly put it, it's it's only by the the Holy Spirit yielding to the Holy Spirit and what what we are learning and being obedient, being quick to follow the instructions that He's laying upon our hearts. Um, looking back at my Christian walk, my early days. I can say that I piggybacked from my parents at the time, but then later on, of course, you have to get out of the nest. That was in my 
early 20s. But when I look at, at in hindsight, I, I, I believe what my thought pattern at that time was that the manifestation of God would be seen more in, you know, have I done, have I attended church? Have I tithed? Have I prayed? How many times did I pray? Have I fasted when it was Lent? I was looking at the, the religious perspective. I was not looking at what is the Holy Spirit telling me to do at this point in time in my life? How am I touching the people that he has put in my path? How am I being a representative of God as his ambassador in every circle of life that he has purposely fitted me in? So I thank the Lord because he has a way of finding us. He's so patient and he pursues. He says that he leaves the 99 to find the one. I, I really thank, thank the Lord that he found me. Even in that time when I was still into my religious patterns and the likes, he found a way. He was still speaking to me. He's such a faithful father to each and every one of us. He understands where we are in our journeys. Wherever we are, the Lord has a way of bringing us closer to him, to his truth. Amen. So I used to think that, right, if I have not fulfilled X, Y, and Z, then I am not qualified. Not to say that I should, you know, just recklessly live um, in, this, in this world or be a part of the world and be polluted, but I was really tough on myself and tough on others too. Because you know, when you're tough on yourself, then you're also, you're not very lenient on other people. So I had that kind of judgmental type of perspective when I look at other Christians and what I think a Christian should should be like, right? But I don't, I don't believe that is how God has purposed us to 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 walk in our journey with Him. He wants us to know that it is simply by His grace. It is simply by His grace. So I'm really comforted whenever I read this um, scripture. Um, I look at Ephesians chapter two verse eight to nine, it says, for it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourself, from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. This is such a comfort. This was such a comfort to my life when I came to that knowledge, when he brought, illuminated my heart to understand that truth and to stand by it to understand that he paid he paid it all so i can walk freely knowing that i have grace to take me from one one level to the next i mature because of his grace even in my walk and in my journey with him we are not consumed as well simply by his grace everything that i have it is simply by the grace of god amen so as luck as would have it, <laughs> I don't have to say luck, but I found that in the place of marriage, um, this is where we are really put to test. And you know how I grew up with my checks and balances. Um, so from a very young age, I was very, I was a planner, so to speak. Um, you know, I would know, okay, the tests are coming up at this time, so I need to get ready to to study and to study, you know, I have to address this, that topic and that topic and that topic. I need to meet with so-and-so to fulfill, you know, there's a checklist for everything to make sure that I meet my deadlines and I excel in certain um, maybe exams or whatever it is that has been put on my path. Even if it's if it's work, certain projects that, I, that I've been given, I've been assigned to, Right, so I have checks and balances, but when I got into the covenant of marriage, then these checks and balances were not working. 
you know, I say A and I and I assume that it has been understood as A by my partner, but then at the end of the day, it is translated, it comes, it, it's it's totally different. It's another, it's another understanding, right? So it's where I found that you really need the grace of God in such a place. There is no way you can make it out on your own strength or in your own wisdom because I relied heavily on my intellect and my own wisdom. I would read books, you know, I would listen to, I don't know, so-and-so, um, psychologist so-and-so. Not that God doesn't use those people, but that is what I, I put my, my confidence in, that if, if we address, you know, this challenge in this way, then this is how we will get out of this um, tunnel. But alas, it was not, it was not like that. It only left me feeling empty, so to speak. Whenever I, you know, you, you start you start attempting A, you don't get the result that you, you were hoping for. You go to B, you can go up to Z, but still you don't get where you thought you would get. So there would be frequent um, fights and quarrels, right? But then later on, now that I look back, it was God revealing to, to me the places in my heart where I was not yielded to him. And how would he manifest himself in me and through me when I was still heavily relying on myself, right? God says, take my yoke and learn from me. Now, like what, how we have even heard from our sister who was sharing earlier um, about how wives should live and how they should be submissive to authority. That concept of authority to me, uh, it was it was a bit puzzling. I was of the notion that you know things should be 50-50, fine, you're the if you're the head of the family, then this is the way that you should run it. I had a script, you know, even for him and how he should run things. Right. And there was my own script on how I should run things. But what was God's script? Because I believe also that each and every union has been uniquely um, put together. There is, a, there is a reason why I have been put together with this man. There is a reason why my sister has been put together with that brother. God understands exactly what it is that is in my heart that needs to come out so that I can manifest himself more and leave out all these other worldly things. Right. So... After a lot of going around and round and round the same mountain to the point where I thought, I think, I think God, this is it. You know, um, it, it didn't work. It has not worked. This is it. Maybe it was, it was not meant to be for me. Um, then there was a sister who had said, okay, she was coming up with a, um, a platform of, of wives to, to join together, to just learn from the word of God. And at that point when I was joining, I thought to myself, God, I'm going to join just to understand what it is that I actually failed. But it's not because I want to continue with this in this walk or in this journey with this man. I think I've, I'm, I've surrendered him completely to you. You have your way and have your way with me. Just teach me what it is. You know, in project management, so um, I, uh, I, I practice that uh, where I work. Um, there is something called lessons learned. So for me, this was a lessons learned specific type of um, let's say stations that I wanted to go through just to check, you know, just to, to see what it is that 
you know, I had failed. I had failed that. Because I also believe that it took two to tango and definitely there was, even though I thought at that time that, you know, if, if it is if it is maybe 100% pile, let's look, maybe my share would be maybe 20%. The rest, you know, it's, it's the other guy who's at fault. So I said, okay, I'll take this as, as a lessons learned type of course or meeting. But like I said, you know, God has his ways of finding people. So slowly but surely, he began to speak to me and convict me in my heart. But Joyce, look at this. There is a word, I think it's in, in Romans um, 13, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, it talks about submission to governing authorities. And it says... Um, For the one in authority, that is verse four, is God's servant for your good, for my good. I would ask myself, for my good, how? Lord, how has this served me well? You have seen all the pains, all the heartaches, all the tears that I've cried. You have seen all the efforts that I put in. You know, again, I was going through my checklist. I was not manifesting God at that time. I was manifesting myself. I was having my own pity party, my own selfish ways, my own selfish ambitions. That that is what I had put at the center. It was it was not godlike. It was not Christ minded. So I came to a point that I understood. Okay, so it was for my good that I had to go through all of that. Not not to say that I I'm completely um hundred percent. Let me say. I'm converted. I don't know if that's the right word to put or, or the right phrase to use because I it's still a um I'm still a work in progress, but to a large extent, God revealed to me that it's 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 not really about you. Don't you see that every situation that I put you in or every way you find yourself, there is a lesson that I'm that you're supposed to to get you're not getting it you're not getting it this is for your own good when you submit to this when you realize that you're not the perfect person that you thought you are because god sees us deeper than we think that that than we perceive ourselves to be sometimes we set ourselves so high we exalt ourselves but when we exalt ourselves then we become, we, we are humbled. It's not even God who humbles us. It's the circumstances in our lives that humble us. But the grace of God finds us. And when we are able to, to come to a place of understanding and obey and surrender to his will, then it's a, it's a beautiful start. It's a fresh start. So I believe for God to manifest himself, first and foremost, you need to renew your mind. So God was renewing my mind. He renewed my mind in such a, in such a magnificent way. Amen. He says, do not conform, conform to the patterns of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Because everything starts with the mind. Any seed of doubt, anything that the enemy wants to place in your life or position in your life, it starts with your mind. The, your perception, sometimes you think it, they are yours, but no. The enemy also has a way of putting thoughts in our mind. That is why we are told to not wage war according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. And we should bring down or we should take captive any thought that sets itself up against the knowledge of God and bring it to the obedience of Christ. Amen. So it got, it got me to understand what my role actually meant to stand as a wife. Because another thing that I also hmm, was caught up in like I said, you know how I was a very, I would say I wanted to, to 
to put myself as a, you know, I was an upright Christian, right? So if it is fasting, I would, I have fasted God because, you know, to do with these challenges that I'm facing. But this person is not changing. These challenges just still remain the same. This mountain is not shaking. This mountain is not moving. There is no sign, nothing. What is happening here, God? So in as much as he was also revealing a lot of things in dreams, but when I looked at the present circumstances, it was, it was just, it was, it was tough at that point at that time. So when I would go to God in prayer, I would be standing there more, more of God have mercy on me. You see, why am I here? You know, things like that. But later on, I've come to understand that when you're in a union and you have the mind of Christ and you're manifesting God in your life, when you go before him in prayer, to pray about any other person. You stand in the gap and you wear the shoes of that person. So if it's for another sister, I would put myself in that sister's shoes and say, God have mercy on me because I have done one, two, three. Right. I wear that burden on myself. I don't distance myself from that situation and say, God have mercy on this person. God have mercy on that person. I put myself you know, I wear that burden for that person on behalf. That is true intercession. You enter into the Holy of Holies to seek God's intervention for this person, but you put yourself in that person's shoes. So in the same manner, when, when you're in the covenant of marriage, when you stand before God, you don't stand in accusation. You don't single out yourself as the one who has, you know, done so many things that have been so perfect, but then you are, you're feeling let down. No. It's now more of God, forgive us. Father, we have sinned against you in doing one, two, three. Illuminate the eyes of our understanding so that we can walk in obedience. Amen. Because you cannot go before God with ill motives and hope that you're going to gain something out of that, that is going to come down and answer your prayers. Remember already that God is a God of order. When I say that he's a God of order, I spoke about authorities. Now, if he has put this authority, it was not by mistake. If it was by whatever error that I got into this, got myself into this marriage, um, you know, God still respects that. He respects that there is a marriage there. So if I'm going before him, I cannot single myself out. He will just take me back to that place that, okay, you're coming to me with this, but have you checked with this authority about this first? So if I want now to come before God in a way that, is more honorable to him. It's not to single out to say that, God, look at your son, one, two, three. No, it's to say, God, look at us. Have mercy on us. This is when I see maybe that my better half, my spouse is doing something that is maybe that I perceive or that I know in my spirit is not in line with the will of God. I cannot point fingers. Rather, I come and bow before his, his throne and seek for mercy for my time for our time of need. It's in James chapter four, verse one to three. It speaks about how we have not because we ask not, and when we ask, we ask because of wrong motives. But God is merciful. Once we have come to understand that it is not about you. It is about both of you. It is about where you're headed together. And it's not about here who is the winner and who is the loser. Amen. So in, in those lessons or in those meetups that we were having from time to time, like I said, God revealed 
all these things and he's still revealing some more. But what I can say, how God has manifested himself in my life now is number one, the way that I pray, yeah, concerning my marriage or concerning anyone else, the way I intercede, right? Another thing um, that he has come to open up my eyes to is to understand that we are in a constant battle. We are in a constant battle and the enemy will not use people who are not close to you to get through to you. He will start first and foremost, like I said, in your mind. So you need to guard your mind with the word of God. You need to guard your mind in prayer. You need to fill up your mind with the word of God. So whatever you're taking in, make sure that it is working to guard your mind. It is it is living bread, the bread of life that Jesus has provided to us through the Bible, the scriptures. There is so much life in them. He has breathed his own life into these. But in addition to that, what I can what I can say, something that I'm I'm really, really, really grateful to God for is the peace that he has given me. I used to read about this, you know, do not be anxious for anything, but with your prayers and petitions, make your request known to God, and he, he will give you that peace that surpasses all understanding. I just used to think, you know, how you sometimes we say these scriptures, we recite them, but we don't really understand what it is that they mean. And it is only when God opens up our eyes, when he opens up our spirits, to really grasp into to contextualize these things and they become life to us that's when you truly it truly hits you in a different way that now when i read it i really sense that god this is you have really granted me this you have removed anxiety from me you have really given me that peace that surpasses all understanding so there are things that happen and i think to myself am i the same person is this still me really how is that possible because that peace now enables me to extend grace to other people as well you know how we are, we read that love is patient love is kind love keeps no record of wrongs get some interference um good. Yeah, thank you yeah those are those are those are values that I can say were not I was were not present. I, were, I did not I did not see as love is patient. Ooh, love is patient. Yeah, I didn't see myself as a very patient person. Kind. Mm, I did you know I expected kindness to come from the other. Oh, I, I expected that when I give kindness, I should also get kindness back. Yeah, tit for tat. That's the way you see it. That the more I give, like, ah, you know, I'm just giving, giving, giving. God, when am I ever going to get back? Like. How, what kind of what kind of transaction is this? You know, it's only one way. How is that? So God has taught me that some of the voids that I was looking to fill from people, it should not be so. He says, cursed is the man, cursed are you when you put your faith in men, right? It should be God above all other things. Where is your, where is your first love? Who is your first love? That is God. Once you have that in your heart, then you're able to extend this love and it is truly visible and tangible from other people. Amen. He has given me a fresh pair of eyes and ears to see other people and to understand how I may be of assistance in a godly-like way to them. Today I can say that when I get to there are moments when I I have to sit like this maybe and um, interact with you sisters on this platform in one meeting or another. My husband can can sit with the children and he will he will give me that time. He understands that I need that time because he has seen the transformation, the manifestation of God in our own home through fellowshipping and getting to know the word of God 
in his truth in such in such moments such as these so i'm i'm really grateful for that um other things that i can say god has really manifested himself through me is it was hard for me to admit when i was wrong but now he has given me that grace to humble myself he has helped me to overlook wrongs he says how you know you should keep uh, no record of love keeps no record of wrongs. Oh my goodness, that was something that I struggled with. I would, I would say, okay, I have a very good memory <laughs> from which helped me in a, which helps me in a lot of circumstances, but also works to my disadvantage at times. Like, I if you've done something, I will, I will keep it in mind. But he has helped me to overlook these things and understand that, you know. When I open that door and I look back on and dwell on such things, ruminate on those things, I'm only cooperating with the enemy, cooperating with, with the other side, with the kingdom of darkness. And you know, Satan doesn't, he doesn't have a hold of our lives without our own cooperation, you know? It takes our own willingness to give him that life and to give him that power over us and authority. We give it to him. So now that I know better by the grace of God and by the power of the Holy Spirit, I can stand in the gap and continuously request that the Lord, please help me because it is only by your mercy and grace that I'm able to overlook these things. I cannot say that I'm able to do it on my own. Like, I, like, like we read in Ephesians 2, it is not, nothing to do with us. It is simply his grace so that we are not able to boast. I cannot boast anything. All credit, all praise, all honor goes back to God. And I'm also very thankful to, to, to all ladies that I fellowship with because um, I think the enemy enjoys leaving people in isolation. When you're working, working on a journey alone, such as sometimes it's challenges in a marriage or in whatever type of setting, if it's grief or anything, maybe illness, um, when you're doing it alone, the enemy has so much power over your thoughts. But when you come into a place like this, there's, you know, this sister will share a testimony, that one will share an encouragement through the word. You, you by the time that you are done, with that session, there's a breath of fresh air in yourself to take you, you know, for another few weeks or days or so. Of course, you should stand on your own two feet, but there is a reason why we have been given communities to fellowship with the word of God. Godly counsel is, is also something that we should consider as a priority in our lives. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you so much. I praise God. Over to you, Sister Pearl. Yes, thank you very much, Sister Joyce. That was very powerful. We thank the Lord for his work in your life. We thank um, the Holy Spirit also for his transformatory work in your life. Sisters, let me try and summarize what she said. Lots of stuff in there. But the summary of what she, she said to us was that she started with self. She started with self until she, the Lord opened her eyes and she came to the point where she realized that we cannot do anything in our own strength. You know, because even the scripture say that by strength, no man shall prevail. No one shall prevail by our own strength. She started with self, her own strength, you know, having her own plans very prim and proper, nothing to go wrong. But then our loving father extended grace to her, stepped into the situation and taught her how to go about it. First, respecting authority, the authority she's under. Sisters, our sister's testimony is loaded with so much. Oh, sorry. So many lessons, so much stuff. And as I listened, I was seeing the work of the Holy Spirit at every stage in her life. And I was also seeing the grace of God at work in her. 
maybe you are here and you think that your life is in a mess or you are struggling with a situation that you don't seem to see God come through for you. What we are learning is that we need to be like Christ. Sometimes he doesn't answer some of the prayers because he wants to change our hearts first, like our sister's testimony. God started doing the work in her heart. You know, she was saying that there were some things in her heart that ought to come out. And Father, like the scripture we read in John 15, Jesus says, Father is glorified when we bear much fruit. So when we are praying and the answers are not coming, we have to find out why. Sometimes it is not much of the devil. It may be a character he is working how to remove, transforming us. There are things in our lives that doesn't look like him. He has to deal with those things. Sometimes too, like she said, we are rebellion. Sorry, we rebel. Sorry, we rebel against authority, especially in our homes. And he comes in to do that work in us graciously. So whilst our eyes are on our husbands, Father is pointing to us. I have to deal with with this i have to remove this and she mentioned that we need to understand understand what we are going through surrender to the lord obey his will and renew your mind with the word of god it's a process it's a process we go through so if we don't understand what we are going through if we, we don't we don't understand the will of god concerning the challenge the will of god concerning the issues surrounding us the issues in the home so many we will struggle when we understand his interest, his stake in the situation, and we surrender, help comes. Then she spoke about grace. When she realized that, oh, okay, this is how God wants her to walk, then grace was extended for her to realign. And I also realized that Sister Joyce took us to a different level of manifesting Christ in our homes, especially to our husbands, the place of intercession. The place of intercession. When we look at Hebrews 4, 14 to 16, it says that since we have a great high priest, Jesus, the son of God, who has gone into heaven, let us hold on to the faith we have. We have. For our high priest is able to understand our weaknesses. He was tempted in every way that we are, but he did not sin. She taught us also about the place of the intercessor imitating Christ in our homes. This is very powerful. I was just enjoying her sharing. I didn't even want her to stop. It's a different level. And she, we, we, we learned, or maybe she shared with us that we should never isolate ourselves from the trouble. We go to Father's throne, the two shall become one flesh. We don't stand, think like, position ourselves like we are right and our husbands are wrong. And so we have gone to headquarters to report them. But we stand in the gap, imitating Christ as the true intercessor, putting ourselves in the place of our husbands. And anyone we want to intercede for, I think that is powerful. Very, very, very powerful. Becoming like Christ. If we want to become like Christ and manifest him, we ought to be true intercessors, putting ourselves in the shoes of the people we pray for manifesting the fruit of the spirit and above all above all depending on the holy spirit for by strength no man shall prevail by strength you and i can do nothing remember the word in proverbs 3 proverbs 3 verse Five to six. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. So tonight, I believe the Spirit of God is talking to you. Sisters, let us not trust in what we know. We put our trust in the Word of God. We lay our issues before Him. We partner with Him to transform us. We work with Him to make us more like Jesus. Let us not fight the hand that is working in us, but surrender every aspect of our lives to him our lives are like rooms many chambers or a house 
Jesus doesn't rush into all the rooms. He will come one at a time. Can I enter the hall? I said, yes, you're welcome. He comes. Can I enter? Can we go to the kitchen? It's a whole journey. It's a journey. Let us allow him. Let's allow him to do his work in us so we can reflect him more to others. God bless you so much. Sisters, we are still sharing. We have one more speaker and then I'll open the floor for us to ask questions and also contribute. But before then, if you have questions, you can send them to me or Sister, Sister Fiona, or you could post them in the, in the chat. We'll read it. Or you could even raise your hand during the Q&A session and I'll call you to, to share or ask your question. Praise God. So at this moment, I want to call Sister Ifwa. Ifwa G. The Lord has laid something on her heart that she wants to share with us too. Let's welcome her. Stay far over to you, please. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sister Pearl. Good evening, sisters. We thank God so much for um for what He's teaching us about this topic. We thank God for our sisters Maud and Joyce who have already shared. Um so when I when I prayed about the topic, um what the Lord put on my heart is the fact that to to manifest God or to be like God or to, to let people experience God through us. We have to carry the presence of God. And so the Lord led me into trying to understand what it means to carry the presence of God. And the first thing that um, the Lord started showing me is um, for us to have the presence of God, one of the first things that we need to do is to love God, is to have a lot of love for God. Now, before I go into the word that the Lord gave me, th this got me actually um, reflecting a bit about what is it that I love, you know? Because some, some of us, we, we can even love, you know, oh, come and preach, you go and preach. You you really enjoy doing it. Or oh, come and sing, you sing. It's very nice. Um, some of us we even love doing charity, you know, the feeling of I've been able to help somebody. There's nothing wrong with that. But I think the commandment that God gives us, and I'm gonna read from Matthew 22, verse 37. It, this verse actually appears in the Bible in Matthew, it appears in Mark as well. He says, and he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. Wow. So then it's, it made me think, so it's possible to love God with a part of my heart because the key word here is all, with all your heart. And that's the reason why I started thinking, eh, I can do God's work without necessarily loving him with all my heart. I can love the work itself. I can love the anointing of God. I can love, you know, the blessings that I get from God without necessarily loving him with all my heart. So if I love God with all my heart, I will carry his presence. And if God's presence is there, it manifests. I think it was Sister Pell that read it, or it was Sister Maud in the beginning that, you know, you, you cannot, light cannot be hidden. We are the light. When the light is there, you can see it. You don't need to do anything. You don't need to. I mean, when we hear the word manifest, also because of nowadays a new age teachings that are out there, it looks as if you have to do something. If the presence of God is there, it manifests. It's, you know, it, it's just there. So then the issue is, am I actually carrying the presence of God? Am I loving him with all my heart? 
if I am loving him right now with all my heart, he will be present. He will manifest. His presence will manifest. But the issue is that sometimes I, I, I don't necessarily love God. I don't necessarily love him with all my heart, my soul, my mind. I really love this verse because it actually talks about some three key things. The heart, the soul, and the mind. And then if we want to continue to explore, then what does it mean? To love the Lord. And the Bible is so clear. It's so cohesive. It says, if you love me, obey my commandments. It's fairly simple. And I want to pull up that verse as well. Just, um, if you love me, obey or keep my commandments. That's in John. John 14, 15. It says, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper who will stay with you forever. He is the Spirit who reveals the truth about God. So loving God is actually a very simple thing. It's either I obey and I love him, or I don't, and I don't love him. So sometimes even we Christians can get into arguments, intellectual arguments about what does the Bible say? Is it true? The Bible says submit. Is it, you know, it doesn't mean that I should be there and be a fool, something, something, using the intellect, our mind. And he says, you should love him with all of your mind. So even the mind, he teaches us how by showing us that we should renew it with his word. Because if we use our own mind empty without his word in it, it is very likely we can't actually love him fully. It also means that we can't obey him fully. So carrying God's presence or manifesting God, first and foremost, it starts with me. It starts with me. I think all our sisters have mentioned it. You know, sometimes we are so quick to show the world what we know about God. We want the world to see something. They only want them to see us. And, oh, when I pray, then you, some people get healed. It means... God, I'm carrying God's, you know, presence. God is manifesting through me. Sometimes we want to see signs and, you know, many, many wonders. We want to see miracles. We want to hear prophecies. We want to give people words and we want it to come and pass. We want people to say, oh, and Sister Ifa prayed for me and I was well. Or Sister Asimesi said a word to me and it came to pass. Or something, something, something. You know, and that becomes a focus. So manifesting God Forget about what other people will see and say and whatever signs and wonders. If I love God and I carry his presence, he, he is responsible for the manifestation. It will manifest. Because typically, the biggest manifestations of God that I have experienced, that I have paid, you know, maybe God has used me small, be, are normally things that I cannot process myself as a person, as a human being. In my flesh, I cannot process it. What do I mean by that? What I mean is that whenever I have a conversation with somebody and later I hear that God did something in their lives, the thing that happened, is, it's, it's beyond what I could imagine. So it is not about how I present myself or, and, you know, Sister Fua is carrying God. So when she talks, even the words are so nice. That's part of it. But the thing that the Lord himself does, his manifestation, because it's a spiritual thing, even I cannot figure it out. And so I cannot say that God is manifesting through me based on what my, my human eyes and my physical eyes can see because he manifests first in the spirit. So if it is spiritual things, then it is when I am also in the spirit, then I am capable of seeing some of it. And then there will be some manifestations in the flesh. But sometimes we are so focused on what is happening in the flesh and especially towards other people. What I have experienced is that if I am carrying the presence of God, if I am in tune with God, if I am loving God, if my entire heart, soul, mind is focused on God and focused on his word, it is impossible for me to enter any space without the presence of God being felt, without God 
manifesting over there. In fact, even I myself, <laughs> I feel it. It starts with me. And so what does it mean to experience God's presence? I mean, some of us, we, all of us, we know what it means when we go to church or we go to a revival or a retreat or, you know, and God's presence shows up mightily. We can see that, but that is just one way in which God's presence manifests itself. In me, and I'll use myself as an example, one of the ways that I experience God's presence is my desires. I talk about desires quite a lot these days. It's my desires. Whenever I can see that my desires are aligned with what God wants me to desire, I know I can feel the presence of God. I know that I am in a place where I am capable of demonstrating God's presence. I am capable of being used to manifest who God is. So that's the reason why I started saying the desire, you know, the desire is always about desiring God himself. That's the desire that we are looking for, desiring God himself. And nowadays we can get distracted with what it is that we are desiring, you know. And I remember some time ago, the Lord told me, and I'm going to talk about this from a different angle than what our sisters have mentioned, um, have spoken, because this is where the Lord wants me to carry it. That because all of us here, we are desiring God, we are serving God, we want to know God, you know, we are interested in God, God will use us. Now, when God starts using us, or God is using us, when God is using us, we have to keep our eyes on desiring God. Because it is very easy because we are in this flesh to desire other things. It is easy to desire physical things. It is e easy to desire, you know, um, there's nothing wrong with it. <laughs> but it can easily get us into a place where we get into trouble. We can desire fame. We can desire numbers. One of the things that I absolutely, I'm so grateful, especially for this ministry, Closer Walkwise ministry, is that nobody cares about the numbers. We care about the numbers because it tells us God is doing things. You know, you know, when people come on Zoom, we are so grateful that God brings his daughters. But whether it's one or it's a thousand, we don't care. We care that God himself handpicks the people, he handpicks the topic. But when you start getting to experience God's presence in you, if you don't take care, you start desiring things like that. You start desiring, I want the numbers. I want them, you know, the gifts of prophecy. I want, there's nothing wrong with it, but that becomes your main focus. I desire. So when people are even around me, I, I desire that they say, oh, this is a child of God because she's something, something. Be careful about that desire. The desire is I desire God. So above everything, when people see me, I want them to see God. That's it. I want them to see God for themselves. I want them to experience God. I want them to also get the giftings of God. I want them to be able to read the Bible and catch what God has taught me along the way. My desire is God. God for me, God for people. That's what God started teaching me, that you are manifesting me. Because when Jesus came, what did Jesus come to do? Jesus brought heaven down to us. He came to show us his father. He came to show us what it means to be like his father. That's all Jesus did for us. When you see Jesus walking on earth, I mean, don't you think Jesus could have built houses, you know, all the disciples around him, he could have distributed you. Now you are going to raise the dead. You, you are going to do this. You are going to do this. He gave them the, you know, the opportunity to experience the power that his father has. But above all, what Jesus brought was God. What Jesus brought to us was salvation. And that is what he wants us to also desire. That's what he wants us to carry when people see us. So it is irrelevant how many people I'm teaching and making noise on a platform. If my desire deeply inside my heart is not God for myself, if I don't desire to be like God, if I don't desire to be close to God, if I don't desire that God is my life, my entire life is about God. It's not about anything else. Everything else that is going on in my life is just, you know, a consequence of this realm that we live in that we need to go through. But the desire, and that's also the reason why when we go through, you know, tribulations, very recently I was, I was, you know, I was sitting there and I felt like the Lord was showing me like, you know, one of these visions that you get when you're sitting there, the Lord was just 
you know, um, it was as if I was having a conversation with God and he was showing me something that I, I was asking him, it looks as if the problems in my life, I don't care. So I was asking him, ah, should I care? <laughs> and this is interesting because did you know very shortly afterwards i'll get a call and somebody will say something which is interesting and i'll say this the full story and i was like ah should i care should i be worried and then i felt god asking me why would you because i you know in the big scheme of who i am who cares whether your toe is hurting whether your head is aching you know and there are two ways to deal with the headache i rebuke you headache go away or you know, don't don't even indulge it. The headache is, you know, it's like it's there. <laughs> it's there. It doesn't change the fact that God is God. It doesn't change the fact that God is big. It doesn't change his power. And then by the time I turn left again, I'm like, oh, the headache is not there again. And it seemed like I was doing the latter. You know, there's a headache and I'm you know, my mind is it's not like I am oblivious or you know, I am disillusioned. It's there. But the desire inside me is to focus on God rather than God. What will you do in this? And so I started having this conversation with God. Uh, is it okay? Am I okay? Should I be worried? Should I be, should I focus? And then I will get a call where somebody will call me and say that, you know, um, this is a person that I know has a gift of prophecy, but the way they operate, it, they will never say, God says, I should tell you this, you know, the way she normally talks is, is like this. She'll say, you know, she'll talk with you. She'll pray with you. Um, and then towards the end, she'll say, I think you should speak to God and pray about it and ask God about this that I am hearing. That God says that you are getting to that place where your focus is me. And it's a very good place to get. Don't let the devil take your focus off that. I was like, whoa, that was just what happened to me before your call came. I felt like my focus is somewhere else. And yet you see people around you and it's like everybody's focus on my toe is hurting. I need a this, I need that. God, give me this. God, do this for me and this. And I'm, think, I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, hey, it seems when I hear somebody in this, I'm praying for people and I'm, my own thing, I'm praying, I speak to God. I, you know, I speak to God about it, but it's not my focus. Like I literally... It's like the thing is like parallel to me, kind of. And so I was telling the person, this, this is what I was thinking about. And so today when I was reflecting about what does it mean to manifest God, God said, when you manifest me, your desire, your focus is me. It's not the gimmicks or anything else. And I'm not saying that I have become so perfect that I've reached it. No, it's a journey that we are on. We are all on this journey together. But there are some aspects of your life that you will realize that is like there is peace over there because you don't even focus on the physical things there. Your focus is on God. And there will be some aspects of your life and my life that we are somersaulting. You know, I like using the word somersaulting. Because the desire, and we can even go on a 40-day fast. The reason why you finish that fast and all God will do inside you is he will put a different desire in you. Or he will show you something that you should work on. It's because he does not ever want us to, to desire anything in this physical realm. His will for us and his plan for us. He says, why did God create us? To please him. And how do you please him? You can't please people when you don't know who they are, when you don't understand who they are. And so that was the other thing that the Lord was teaching me. And then I have this verse that the Lord dropped in my heart when he he started telling me about desiring to please him. So I asked God, what is the first, what, what, what is the first thing to do if I want to desire to please you or desire you? What should I do? What's the first thing to do? And I was quite sure that the, the you know, I was I was expecting or oh, read my word, which I think is part of it. But what the Lord said was, you have to die to self. Wow. You know, we know this Bible verse about dying to self. It's, you know, it's everywhere. There's a lot of it. Now, the first, I'll read from Luke, Luke 9, 23. He says, then he said to them, or oh, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. Let me put it into the context of, you know, everyday interactions with other human beings. 
personally, when I have an issue with another person, whether it is my partner or it's, uh, you know, whoever, work, any human being, when I bring it to, to prayer, the first thing that I always realize God doing inside me is healing myself down to self. It's like, what is what do you want in this situation? Because there are two things you can want. One of two things. The first thing is I want God's will. And if it is God's will, God will kill yourself. He will let you die to self. Which means that his will will be love the other person. It is irrelevant. <laughs> it is so irrelevant what has happened in that situation. The dying to self is always about let self not exist in this. And it is such an amazing thing because as soon as self goes away, what comes is power in the spirit of God. And so dying to self is desiring God. That's also the reason why every time I am doing it, why is he doing that? And why is she doing that? And why are they doing that? And why is it like this? And why isn't it like that? I am off. I am absolutely not desiring God in that minute. In the same way, I am not able to do what he says I should do. I am not obeying him, which means I don't love him. And so I'm not going to carry him. So it's fairly simple. Either I die to myself and then I have, I have taken on the desires of God. Because God, so even his son Jesus, he had to die to self. Even Jesus had to come and die. That's the only method. Even Jesus did not escape the death. And Jesus was without sin. You know, we need to underline that. We need to just be aware when we talk about Jesus like that, that he was actually without sin. So he actually didn't need <laughs> to get rid of his, his sin. And yet the method was dying. So for me, as I'm sitting here, full of my flesh and, you know, you know, a, a son of Adam by birth, born into sin, I can't, I cannot desire God. I cannot please God if I don't die to self. And so it's the reason why God tells us, you know, this verse is in the Bible so many times. It's in, you know, it's in the Bible in different shapes and forms. Even when you go to, um, I think it's in the Psalms, Psalm 37. I'm trying to find where it, 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 it shows up. <clears throat> Let me find it. Let me find it. So I think, yeah, it'll come. I think it's somewhere in Psalm 37. But actually, the Lord just dropped this one. Psalm 34. David, you know, when David wrote Psalm 34, he was, the guy was hiding, was running away from danger. And he wrote this in the verse 18. The Lord is close to the broken hearted. He rescues those whose spirits are crushed. And so if my spirit is high, I'm hyper. It is me. It is about me and blah, blah, blah. It is very unlikely that I am capable of carrying God's presence with me in that situation. So it is not about do's and don'ts. And when you go to the workplace, say this and talk about it nicely. When you go to your marriage, you know, do this, don't do this. I mean, the Bible gives us formulas, like Sister, um, more than Sister Joyce shared, that there are formulas of what to do in a marriage. He says, keep quiet. It's fairly simple. Um, but apart from those specific formulas that we've been given in the Bible, the, the real formula is for me, to carry God's presence. I need to love God. And so for me to love God, one of the characteristics of loving God is I desire him. You see the way some of us, we complain, my husband doesn't talk to me and I can't find, and then when he goes out and my husband, if your partner has cheated, the world has come to an end, I can never forgive him, blah, blah. We are desiring that human being. We desire that they will speak to us in a certain way. We desire that they will look at us. We desire that they will spend time with us. We desire that they will behave in a certain way. And yet we have the God 
who has proven to us over and over and over and over again that he loves us, that he would die for us, that he would do anything for us. He has written so many promises in his word for us, including fear not. One for each day he has said fear not in his word. And yet we desire our husbands, <laughs> some of us, more than we desire God. So it will be difficult to carry God's presence in the marriage when the desire of the man is more than the desire for, for the God in the marriage. Because God is the ultimate. He's the boss in the marriage. And so he's the one that is the most important factor in my marriage. It's the same thing. In my workplace, God is the most important factor. You know, some time ago, I sat down and then I looked at my work and I asked myself, what's the why? Why am I doing this? Yeah, you're being paid a good amount of money. Yeah, that's good. That could be an option of the whys. But then I asked myself again, what is really the why for this job that I'm doing? When we start questioning it and we ask God to teach us the why, you start realizing that suddenly the job does, you don't even have a desire for the job. If you cannot figure out how that job aligns with you serving God. And so some, some have had to pull away from that place. You know, it's not because they were not being paid well or they were not enjoying it or it was not a fantastic option or they didn't have some very good plans for the family and friends and everybody. But suddenly when you start desiring God, so it's a very interesting thing that happens, that the more you start desiring God, the more you realize that even where you work, where you go to, where you, what you do, even for some of us, even the church you go to, the fellowships that you go to, the more you desire. I mean, most of us have been Christians for a while. But it's now that God is bringing us to a place like closer workwives, where they're actually teaching us how to desire God. They are teaching us how to walk in alignment with God. You know, how did we find our way here? It is a desire for God. Desire. He put the desire there himself, but we are aligned with it. That's why we are here. And we are seeking the word. We are showing up. We want to hear more about God's word. So as soon as you start desiring God and you want to love him, which means you want to carry his presence, you want to show him, you know, you want to manifest, you want him to manifest himself through you. He would, you know, he promises us, I order the steps. I'll order your steps in the right way. And so in every situation, like the other sisters have said, you ask yourself, what, what, what is it? What is the why? What are we doing here? What is it about? Is it about intellectual ability? Is that Joyce was talking about that? And many of us, we fall into that trap. Sometimes even when we read the word of God, we want to use our intellect to interpret it. I have noticed one thing. Every time I am able to use my intellect to interpret the word of God, it is very likely I am not interpreting it well. It's my conclusion. If I can use my mind to process it and it seems all in my head, that's when I go on my knees and I say, God, teach me what you want to teach me in your word. Because what my mind is trying to teach me, I am quite sure it's flawed. And so then it brings me to the next thing that the Lord was teaching me. That's to carry the presence of God, humility. It's the basic formula. I have to be humble. I absolutely have to be humble. That's also the reason why when God releases his anointing on people, as for anointing, you know, anybody can be anointed. God, you know, is there. the gifts are there. He talks about it. Just desire. God, I want the gift of healing. You can get it. It's not a new it's not, it's not that difficult to get it. Just desire it and pray and ask God and position yourself. You'll get it. But there is there are different levels of it. And God releases it according to humility. Because if I'm going to carry God's presence, it means that I'm going to be powerful. Do we understand it? If I carry God's presence, if I am capable of seeing people, you know, spit at me, put nails in my hand, do terrible things at me, and I am still capable of saying, I'm going to love you because of the presence of God inside me. It means I suddenly become the most powerful person in every place that I, I go to. And so that power is released to everybody who is a child of God. But it is, there is a dosage of it. Because if if I is a very arrogant person, then the dosage will, you know, God, God will have mercy on me <laughs> so that the dosage that I will get will not be the one that I'm going to use to destroy my own self and destroy other people because then pride and arrogance will come in. That's the reason why for me, it's, you know, the whole thing of, oh, I want people to see, what should they see? They should see God. That's all. When people see me, they should see God. Anything else they see is, is, not, is not needed. It's irrelevant. I don't even need them to see, you know, my blessings. Lest they last for those things and then forget about God. You see? 
And that happens a lot. So you hear somebody sharing their testimony of how they had a child. And the whole testimony, all you hear out of it is, me too, I can get a child. That's not what you should get out of that testimony. What you should get out of the testimony is, I want God. I want that God that that person had that made them able to have that child. Whether I will get the child or not, I don't care. But that, that thing, that thing, the God, the power, I want it. The experience, the intimacy. And so God started teaching me, hey, may you look for me. Me, that's it. Seek me. Everything else, it will come. It, it will come. And I have experienced it so much that we are busy doing something else before we realize something else has happened. There is a statement that I heard recently. When you see people that are desperately and deliberately and honestly seeking, desiring, serving, walking in God's way, you will see it. In this ministry that we are speaking on, in Close Our Wise, the people that God used to start the ministry, you can see it. You can see it, you know. In fact, when, when, you, when you see, um, what is it called? The things that God is doing in this ministry, it, would, it tells you about the desire of the vision bearers. Their desire is God. That's the reason why I can come and I can get God. You too, you can come, you get God. Everybody will come. If our desire is money, when you come, you get money. And there are places you go, when you go, they are teaching money all the time. Money, 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 money. And people go, they'll follow hundreds of thousands because everybody wants money. They can even tell you, go and do something, something, and people go and do it. And they'll be deceiving people. Sometimes they're not deceiving people. They're actually operating in, in genuine anointing. But when you go to a place where you see that God is the thing that you know, is being sold here, if we were to call it a business, you will see the manifestation. And so I want to end and say that for me, when I ask God, how do I manifest you? He said, you don't need to do anything excessively. All you need to do is to have me. That's it. And to have me, I've given you my commandment. I said, love me with all your heart, all your soul, your entire mind. Which also means that every time I have these thoughts and these things that I want to contradict or I want to come up with my own opinion about the word of God, I have not loved God with all my mind. So there is a part of my mind that is still wandering away. It is going, uh, you know, it is wandering. So if I still want to argue about it, it is so difficult, you know, it's so difficult to look away when my husband is misbehaving. It's so difficult to do this. It's so difficult to do that. I am so tired. If I want to talk like that, it means that there is a part of the love that is not for God. It's for something else. And the honest truth is we are human. That's why he actually gives us even those commands. If he didn't know that our flesh will come and misbehave, he wouldn't give us those commandments. So to manifest God, I simply have to carry his presence. And to carry his presence, I need to do what he says I should do. That will activate his presence in me. I'm going to, I'm just going <clears> to <throat> add this verse. Romans 12, verse 1 to 2, because that's the last thing that the Lord was trying to teach me. He says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. When you sacrifice, people see it. But what kind of sacrifice are you making? Because sometimes, like, I talk a lot about submission in marriage. People want me to sacrifice that, that, that the revelation that God has given me about submission for, you know, for favor. <laughs> like, I, they want me to care about whether they like me or not. I don't care. That, that kind of sacrifice I'm not going to make. But the sacrifice that, you know, I am feeling some way. And yet I can see God telling me, die to yourself, die to yourself. Let your flesh go, let your flesh go. Come and, you know, sacrifice, giving your ego, giving your rights. That kind of sacrifice is what Romans 12, 1 and 2 is talking about. And so the work of manifesting God, it comes with sacrifice. But the question is, which sacrifice? There is always a sacrifice. The question is, which one are you sacrificing? And one thing the Lord taught me very vividly is that he is a God of order. I cannot 
claim I'm doing his work, his work, or I am a child of God. When I have so much disorder in my own life, my own life, there's disorder. And what does that mean? The way I walk, the way I behave. Whenever there is a sacrifice, I won't sacrifice. It is me, it is me. Everybody please me, everybody look at me. No, 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 it's if I and if I will and if I. I'm not sacrificing anything. So there are things in the kingdom that require sacrifice. In fact, sacrifice is what activates covenant as well. So that's the last thing that I'll, I'll share here because we don't have a lot of time. And then the verse for the, the humility part, that was Philippians 2.8. That says that in being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. I cannot carry God's presence without humility. When Jesus was um, baptized, he said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. Even Jesus needed to please his father. He did when he came on earth. So his father gave him the confirmation. Now I am well pleased. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. He said, he confirmed that he was pleased. I, we, you and I, we need that confirmation that he's pleased in us. And for him to be pleased in us, we have to humble ourselves like Jesus did to the point of death. Otherwise, it is not God I'm pleasing. So it is loving him. It is desiring him. They are all the same thing, walking in humility. And then I can carry his presence. And then, it, I mean, it, when people see me and they are, they are, interacting with me as a child of God. If I am carrying God's presence, I don't need to even open my mouth. I have experienced it a lot of times. You don't even need to open your mouth. The presence of God goes. Your heart will speak what is inside your heart. He says, your heart, your soul, your mind. You see, he doesn't say with your mouth. He didn't say love me with your mouth. Most of us, we do it with our mouth. I love you, Lord. We can even put our heads on the floor and scream and some assault him. You know, when people see us, it looks like we love God. Ama. He looks inside the heart. He looks at your soul. He looks at your mind. And if th those three things together, love him totally, his presence is guaranteed to manifest in situations. So I'll end here so that we can have time for questions. God bless you. Over to you, Sister, um, Sister Pearl. Yes, please. Thank you very much, Sister Ifwa. That was powerful. God bless you so much. Sisters, we thank the Lord for how far he's brought us and all the things he's teaching us through our sisters this evening. Sister Ifua has shared so much. I've written like three, three sheets of papers. I don't know how to do this someday, but I know the Spirit of God will, will help, help me. So we've learned from her. In fact, the Holy Spirit spoke them through her to us. Um, the ways by which we could manifest God's presence. She said we don't need to um, take it. We don't need to say it. We don't need to draw people's attention. But there are certain things that when we do, the presence will be evident on our lives. It will manifest. People will see it. They will touch it. They will feel it. And she said the first thing is to love God. We love him by desiring him, loving him, not halfway, half-hearted. We have to love him with all our hearts, with all our minds, with all our soul, with all our strength. And the word says that loving God means obeying his commandments. First John 5, 3. We can say we love him and disobey him. Loving him means fix our focus on the Lord. We can't love someone and be distracted by other things we can't love anything loyalty so we, we need to focus even our troubles and seem like they don't exist she mentioned that we need to die to self when we die to self it ushers in the power of god and that is to say we need to walk in um, humility we need to be humbled. When we humble ourselves, God will show up. It will be difficult to carry his presence in our marriages if all we desire are our spouses, the job, the children, 
even though they are good in themselves, we cannot put anything in the place of God. Our loyalty should be 100% towards him. So she said, concluded that manifesting God is simple. I don't need to do any physical work to carry his presence. I have to be like Christ. Jesus Christ humbled himself and we saw the power he carried, how he demonstrated the power of God. And so sisters, we've heard it all. Pray that the Spirit of God will help us. Oh, from all the sharings, we, we, we have come to the conclusion. I know we know, but we can conclude that all these things we are hearing are not, not things that we can do in, in our own strength. It is the Spirit of God who is working in you and I. And all the three sisters have reminded us, it's a journey. It's a journey. Let us not be overwhelmed. Sometimes when people speak and we hear them, our minds or either our minds or our own weaknesses. We try to compare ourselves, our journeys to them, and like we are like, hey, is that why is here and then I'm here? When can I get the hey? How can I do the hey? The way she's talking. Let us not be overwhelmed. Let us not be overwhelmed. It is a journey. And we all didn't start at the same time. It is not like a marathon race where a group of people start, ah, everybody is going at the same pace, finishing at the same time. No, some have taken the lead, some are in the middle, others are coming. So wherever you find yourself tonight, there's one word I'll use to encourage you. Everything you are hearing is the work of the Holy Spirit. To obey the word, to read it, to understand it, to walk in it, it is all by the power of the Holy Spirit. For Jesus told us clearly that without him, we can do nothing. So let's rest assured that once we are willing and we yield to the spirit of God, our lives will be transformed to his own glory. Desiring him more than anything else will open the doors to many things in our lives. God bless you all three sisters for sharing with us what the Lord has taught you. Amen. So at this juncture, I would love to open the floor for us to continue the sharing. Sister Stella, please, are you with us? If you are with us, you can unmute and share with us. And then we can take in some questions. I haven't received any questions yet. Sister Stella, please, are you with us? Okay, okay. Please yeah, I'm go here. On. Yeah. Kindly. Yeah. Yes. Oh, okay. Okay. Thank you very much. God bless you so much, Sister Pell. And thank you for the opportunity and for asking me to share. We thank God. I know our, I couldn't join from the beginning, but I know our sisters have shared a lot with us. So I will not really say so much here. I just, I'll just chip in a little bit more. But we thank God for, um, for talking, for, discussions like this because uh, sometimes even if we know them we need to refresh our mind we need to know the importance the significance of getting closer to our God and manifesting God because if you look at 2 Corinthians 5 20 it says what well, we are Christ's ambassadors this is one one scripture that really sort of speak to me you know speak to me when I initially sort of became a Christian and it still speaks to me you know so I try to look into who an ambassador is, you know, all the time. So to know what it's expected of me. An ambassador means you are representing, you know, your nation in another country. You are a representative, you know. So that what it tells me that as a Christian, as a child or a daughter of God, I'm representing God here on earth. No matter where I am in my home. I'm Christ ambassador. I'm Christ ambassador. I'm Christ representative. I'm representing God. So whatever I do should portray because when you are an ambassador, let's say of Ghana to any other country, you represent God. Uh, sorry, you represent Ghana. So whatever you do should reflect on the policies, the rules, the culture of Ghana. You know everything. You have to speak the language of Ghana. Like you have to let people know the beautiful culture you are representing in a different nation. So in the same way, when we are representing, when we are like sort of Christ representative on earth or in our homes, 
we have to let like um to me it spoke to me that i have to let my husband my children to see christ in me to see i have to manifest god and then manifesting god is is means what it means representing him show you letting everything like whatever comes out of you it's not sometimes all the time to show who you are she show who you have believed in so if you say that you are a daughter of zion you're a daughter of god and you are god's representative in your home that means everything what i'll do is it talking about god what, how I talk, it doesn't reflect on God's values. Does it reflect on who God is? Or am I just solo? Because the Bible says without faith, we cannot please God. And whatever, like we shouldn't just be readers, we should be doers. That means the doers is linked to the fact that we are representatives of God. We are ambassadors. We are supposed to manifest him wherever we are. Because you can't just say it with your mouth. It's where you do it, that is where we will know what you have believed in and who you are really are. You know, sometimes that's why sometimes we say beauty is not only the outwardly, it should be inside as well. What comes out of you should gives you a totality of who you are. So as Christ representatives, everything that we do should sort of represent, um, should actually talk about who we are and talk about. Like people should see the connection between us and God, just as somebody representing another country in another nation. Everything, like, we, we, you don't have to be like an ambassador. Okay? When anybody asks you about the culture of Ghana, you say, oh, I'm not sure, I don't know. You should know because you are representing Ghana, for instance, in, let's say, in England. You know, the, you, you should know what you are representing. You should know the policies and all that. You know, so um, so with me, what I want to link with is we, if we are ambassadors, we should sort of represent Christ in our homes, and our children should see that. You know, um, my in my experiences with my children when they were younger actually uh told me that like they really when I mean I really think they are not watching me, they are watching me. I remember my husband and myself used to tell one of my one of our girls, I have twin girls, they are teenagers now. We we would always tell them that she she doesn't copy the good things that we do. She only copies the bad things. <laughs> the things that we do that we think, oh well, yeah, we shouldn't have done that. That is what she will copy. Oh, like we yelling at each other in front of them. She she will start yelling with her sister. She, she's like, oh, we say something that we know that this one, we shouldn't have said it. That is what she, then she will tell you, say, say, you, oh, can, say you said it, you said this, I heard you saying it. I said, oh, but you have to copy everything I say. That's the case. And so I would say, you have to copy. And she said, oh, yeah, you, if you are doing it, that means I can also do it. So that is when I realized that it's like, I need to be careful, you know, what I am representing, what I am actually um showing you know my 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 behavior my attitude towards things i have to if i call myself a woman of god i have to let her know you know who i am i have to know i have to let her know that christ that is in me not only not using my mind to do things or anyhow because she was just copying everything i do whether good or she wasn't even copying the good ones i think she was getting attracted with the things that Maybe I'm thinking, well, I shouldn't have done this. You know, that is what she was getting attracted to. So we need to be, so as um, children, of, as children of God, as um, women of God, I believe that we need to be sort of prayerful. We need to um, let the Holy Spirit direct us in our homes because that's our first point of contact, that in our homes we need to represent God fully. We have to let the people around us, and sometimes it's not only our children and our husband in our homes, maybe sometimes we have other people, like in my home, for instance, I have a student lodging in our basement, you know, and you may think he's not watching, but he's watching, you know, sometimes he thinks that, oh, he's always on his phone, but he's watching everything, he's listening and all that. So we, 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 it's like, what does he, well, I'll, tell, I'll ask myself, like, what is he seeing? What is he, like, is he actually seeing Christ? Am I manifesting Christ in the home? So these are some of the things, like, for me, I believe it's um sort of very important. 
And I'm um, talking about another another verse that I want to relate to the fact that we need to manifest Christ is First Peter two nine. First Peter two nine is one of the verses like verses I really sort of um it's it always talk to me, you know, laugh so much, and I know it's a familiar um verse for most of us. See, it says what, well, but you are a chosen people, a a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. You are what? He says, a holy nation, a holy nation individually, God's special possession, you know, collectively you are a holy nation. Individually you are, and you are God's special possession. I want to, God's special possession. That means you, God possess you. You belong to God. You know, when we say somebody's possessions, it means somebody's property belong to God. So as children of God, as believers, when we've accepted Christ as, as, as our personal Savior, we belong to God. He says that you may declare the praises of him who have called you from darkness. He has called you from darkness. So you no longer belong to darkness, but you belong to light, you know, and you are a child of light, you know, and the Bible says, well, as children of light, we have to walk in light we have to you know let people see the light that is in us so it, um certain things that we do we need to check is it like part of the old lifestyle which is part of the darkness or is it the light of god is it the light is it what god wants uh, god, god wants people to see in us is that what has to come out of us now that we have we are in a new kingdom without right now that we belong to the kingdom of God, you know. But for us to do this is for us actually equipping ourselves, praying, reading our word, and letting the Holy Spirit direct us, you know. Because I always say it's not by might, it's not by power, but it's by the Spirit of God. It's only through the Spirit of God that we can live that life to manifest, to represent, and to be ambassadors of Christ wherever we are, especially in our homes. You know, the, 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 our eyes are watching. You know, when you think nobody is watching, you know, it, it amazes you what they, sometimes one of my children even tell me that, I, I tell them, when did I do this? They, they will tell, oh, last time you did this. Or I said, when? They tell you, oh, you did that. They will, just, they will give me the date, when, and um, what I actually said, you know, to my amusement. So we, we, they are watching all the time. And as Christ uh, representative, we need to exhibit, you know, we need to exhibit Christ in everything that we do. We need to exhibit Christ because um, that is who we are. You know, that is who we are. That is God's expectations from us. So we are just praying, we just pray that, we will be that kind of sister, that kind of woman who is representing Christ in full totality wherever we are, especially in our homes. I know time is far spent, so I will not really, I will sort of um, end here. So basically what I'm saying is that we are Christ representatives. We are Christ ambassadors in our homes. People are watching, especially our children and even our husbands, they are watching. So let's represent Christ fully. Let's manifest, you know, God has um, bring us to a point, you know, of putting a whole lot in us. And we are his chosen generation, royal priesthood. We need to be that priesthood in our homes, you know, for people to see. We need to be that representative that is talking God's language that is manifesting God's character, you know, not letting our own self or by like, doing things anyhow, haphazardly, but we have to be under, we have to let the Spirit of God and be under the Holy, the Holy Spirit and be, and let the Holy Spirit direct us in all that we do, you know, and um, for us to achieve this too, we need to be prayerful because they've been watching, you know, they're watching everything that we do. The people, the children, they are sort of watching. Like I said, sometimes when I'm thinking I'm being like a careless with things, that is what my daughter is even copying. <laughs> you know, when I'm thinking I'm joking and um, this is all oh, sort of, oh, I know I shouldn't have, I, do, I, sh I know I shouldn't do this. this. That is what she is copying. So sometimes even when we think we are joking, we need to be careful with that. We need to make sure that is this what God wants from us? Is this what we have to manifest, you know, uh, where we are 
you know, is that what you want? Is that what people should see? You know, is it going to be a blessing? Is it going to inspire the people around us? You know, because we are Christ's representatives, we are Christ's ambassadors. So it's important for us to represent him and for us to manifest him fully, you know, not anyhow at all, fully to his glory. Amen. I will pause here. So if there's any question that maybe I can, I'll just chip in. So um, pause here. Thank you very much, Sister Pearl. So thank you. Thank you. So Sister Stella, God bless you for blessing us. So let me attempt to summarize what she said. She said to be to manifest God means we need to be true ambassadors of Christ, and that is who he has made us to be. And she encouraged us, you know, that as ambassadors, we need to understand the culture of the kingdom we belong to. To be true ambassadors of Christ, we need to understand the culture of the kingdom of God where we belong to and align to everything the word sees in order to reflect the one we are representing. She also um, mentioned that we need to set a good example to our children because they learn from us, whether good or bad, they learn from us. So we have to be careful and be true ambassadors in our home. And lastly, she mentioned that we, we need to remember that we are a chosen generation a royal priesthood like this like what I said we cannot get up and behave like the world behaves we need to remember who we are and whose we are and walk in that reality when we do loving our God serving the king the presence will come and we will be true ambassadors to, of Christ to the world Sister Stella, God bless you so much. Sisters, the floor is open for questions. If you have any questions, okay. Please, any questions? Okay, Sister Fiona, please go ahead. Hello. Hello, can you hear me? I'm now Please hearing you. Hear I don't know oh, I'm sorry, I was using my thoughts. Yeah, I was saying that, um, sorry, I, I don't know how much time we have left, but something struck me as sister, if I was sharing, I just wanted to top up. Um, You know, as she was talking about carrying the presence, my mind went to the time in the Old Testament. Well, it's not my mind, the Holy Spirit actually brought that to my, my attention. A time when the Ark of the Covenant was being brought back by David and um, he had um, appointed some people to carry it and Uzzah tried to, um, the, the Ark sort of was shifting and then he tried to hold it and then the Lord struck him. And as she was talking about carrying the presence, it just occurred to me suddenly, you know, that we, we need to be careful. God is a loving father. He's, he's gracious. You know, he's merciful. He sent his son to die for us. But we should not take him for granted. So that the Ark of the Covenant had been sitting in Abinadab's house for a while. And sort of, it was something that he thought, oh, I see this every day. So it was going back and forth, back and forth. And then he, Uza, this is Uza. So he probably thought, oh, this is something that I can, I can, I can touch, even though there were specific instructions as to how to deal with it. And I think it's the same for us. You know, Father tells us he's a loving father, notwithstanding, but he tells us how to live our lives. You know, he says, if if we love him, we must obey his commandments. And I think um we've gotten too familiar with you know, it's okay, we can we can shortchange him after all. He doesn't even he doesn't even appear like the old testament days to come and punish us or anything like that. So we just sort of take him for granted and, and, and you know do things anyhow. 
But he's asked that he says, um, what's the scripture that, just one second, please. I just hope I'm not taking too much of your time. Um, what's this? Sorry, I, I had something. Aha, uh -huh. he says in Hebrews 12, verse 14, that follow peace with all men in holiness, without which no one shall see God. So that if we are manifesting the presence of God in our lives, then we must be pursuing holiness. It means that when the conversation is not going God's way, you move away. When the deal is not going God's way, you must stand and say, no, I won't do this. I'll give a small example. I mean, I, I wish I had more time to talk about this because as our sisters were talking, the Holy Spirit was just drawing my attention to so many things. There was a time I had to go to rent control for some proceedings. And when I got there, this lady, I mean, she was so greedy. She said, how much do you have? And I told her how much I had in my bag. Meanwhile, there's a there's an amount of money to be paid. And then I told her, she said, no, is there's more? Bring it, bring it, bring it. And she took all my money just to write a letter for me. And I was really worried. I wasn't happy about it. You know, it's like I was caught in a spell of the moment. So the second time I had to go there again, I said a prayer to God. I said, God, I don't want to go and pay anybody bribe. I don't want to. I mean, this is who I am, I don't want to pay bribe. And when I got there, she was there, but somebody else attended to me. And I realized that because I prayed that prayer to God, he went ahead of me. And we can all do that. There are places we go to where people are asking for bribes and all that. But we can actually tell God, no, God, I want to carry your presence into this place. This is not me. Sometimes we work in certain companies and be like, oh, as for the company, that's how they do their thing. Me, I'm holy, moon, but that's how they do their things. We can't shortchange God. His way is his way. Without holiness, no one can see God. So it's important that we stand firm. And the Holy Spirit, of course, is there to help us so that we must be able to, in situations where we find it's impossible, uh, pray and, and tell God to help us. And um, I wanted to, yeah. So as our sister shared about uh, reflecting, being God's ambassadors in our homes, I don't, thank you, Sister Stella, for sharing that. And beyond that, it has to yield results so that we ambassadors, we are actually, what do ambassadors do? We are attracting people to, to our country. You know, when, when, when they see us, they want to, to know, oh, Ghana, oh, wow, I didn't know about Ghana. Oh, these are the people in Ghana, this is what they wear, oh, this is how they behave. Oh, Ghanaians are nice people. So that they want to know, they want to see you. So two things, a state of your heart. Because, I mean, if we were just to look at David, the way David was, he will say, oh, David, yeah, he's not an ambassador for the kingdom. He's not even manifesting God's presence because of the things he did. But his heart. So that all these things that we're talking about, yeah, sometimes we not pursue holiness and everything, but what is our heart saying? And the Holy Spirit has been walking this journey with me a lot. And it's not, it doesn't make me complacent, but I know that God loves me. So that God knows that, look, your heart is, you don't want to do this. There's a difference. A heart that doesn't want to do it, but does it. And it's so remorseful within. It's like you're so pained. God, I didn't want to do this, but I did this. A repentant heart. We look at Judas versus Peter. And, and I, I believe that when our heart is right, we are manifest, we are manifesting God's presence because He knows. He knows that our heart desires to, to do right by Him. And then finally, we win, we need to be so bold to win souls into the kingdom. So I was listening to a woman of God yesterday. And she was talking about how her family, nobody marries and has children. And she said, lie, lie, you know, so she fasted, she prayed, she went dry fast three. I'm not saying anybody should go and do fire, dry fast, but she stood on the word of God boldly, boldly. And she has three children now. And people come to her and say, hey, you, this lady, your house that people mind, you don't have children, take me to your God. So that it's not enough that we are carrying the presence for people to see. But people, the, the end result, more critically thinking, it should be for people to want to know this God so that we win souls over to the kingdom. People will come and say, what is, it's not like we're just wearing as a badge, but we are yielding results from it. So but I want to end here. There's a lot more I would have said, but we don't have time. So thank you for allowing me. Thank you so much. Okay, God bless you for sharing thank you um, sisters our time is fast spent but we can spare like three minutes for any questions i haven't received any in my chat yet 
Um, let me see whether there's another hand. Okay. Any questions? Okay. I guess. Okay. I believe we are, we are, I was going to say I guess, but I don't guess. I believe <laughs> we've been well fed by the Holy Spirit through these um, sharing and teachings. And the Bible says, now that we know these things, we will be blessed, be blessed if we do them. And I just want to end with this word. Let's go home and read. Let's go back and read John 16. 12 to 14, or even up to 15, what Jesus Christ says about the Holy Spirit, talking about the Holy Spirit not speaking on his own, but he will take from what belongs to Jesus and give to us. This should make us cherish his ministry in our lives. Now, whatever he tells us is from the throne room of Father. And when we obey him, then transformation comes. We can do nothing without the Holy Spirit. So we draw the curtain on tonight's session. I pray that the Spirit of God will help each and every one of us. I pray that he will meet us at a point in our lives, at every stage and in every circumstance we find ourselves in. He will come and help us. I pray that my life and yours will be transformed. I pray that we will love God, we will desire him more than anything in this world. And I pray that he will enable us to walk in these things he's been teaching us, all to the glory of his name. And I pray finally that Christ will increase in each and every one of us and we will decrease all to his glory. Amen. Sister Ifua, God bless you so much for making time to come and share with us. Sister Maud is left already. Sister Joyce, God bless you. Sister Stella and Sister Fiona, we appreciate your time and your contributions. God bless you so very much. Thank you so much. So sisters, we've come to the end of the session. Shall we share, unmute and share the grace together? Please. Then we can hand over to the tenth session. May and the love, grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the, Lord Christ, Jesus Christ, the, the love, love of God, the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit, the love of God, the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit, the love of God, the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit, the love of God, the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit, the love of God, the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit, the love of God, the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit, Forever and ever and ever. Amen. 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 Again next Amen. Week, God willing. God bless us all. So I hand over now to. Let me... Please hand over to um, Justina, Sister Pell.